welcome everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to uh, start our Citroen Center postmortem event. The Citroen Center was created through gifts of friends, colleagues, former students, and family to honor the career and legacy of Professor Jack Citroen. The purpose of the center is to advance knowledge of public opinion and political culture, both nationally and internationally, through reporting and advancing cutting edge re research and through lectures and conferences, as well as original polling and research grants. Uh, we are on our fourth Citroen event uh, of the fall, um, which is quite the, quite the schedule. We had a great event on race, a great event on the pre-election, we had the Putnam Citroen Award lecture and uh, now this postmortem. And we will also have a lineup for the spring. And if you haven't signed up for our email list, our list please check out the Citroen Center uh, website. Which you can just Google or you can see on, uh, find on the Matrix website. We really do have a, a pretty incredible lineup of folks to tell you about. I'm just getting a, a notice saying my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully it'll hold up. Um, Peter Hart uh, is gonna start us off today and he's a leading pollster in the US and the chairman of uh, Peter D. Hart Research Associates. Uh, Peter has provided NBC News and the Wall Street Journal with polls since the 1980s. His clients include over 40 US senators and governors, uh, among them Hubert Humphrey, Lloyd Benson, Jay Rockefeller, and Bob Graham. Um, Hart uh, gave our Citroen Award lecture uh, uh, two years ago, and is a great friend of the Citroen Center, and we're just absolutely thrilled to have him back. Uh, Lynn Vaverick is the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at UCLA. She's also a columnist at the New York Times, recipient of the Andrew F. Carnegie Prize in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Lynn is a preeminent scholar of elections in the U.S. and has published numerous, numerous articles uh, and five books, including the most recent Identity Crisis, um, which is the single best book uh, you can read about the 2016 election. And if you haven't read it yet, it should all be on the top, so top, of, your, uh, top of your list. Um, and finally, uh, Nate Pers Persley is the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and is a nationally recognized scholar of constitutional law, election law, and the democratic process. Um, uh, Nate has published uh, dozens of articles in both scholarly publications and popular media, media on the legal regulation of political parties, on issues surrounding the census and redistricting, and on voting rights and campaign finance reform. He's also served on presidential commissions and state redistrict, redistricting commissions um, on election administration. Uh, so we're going to go on that order. I'll also be presenting. I should have said that I'm a professor here in the political science department and I also study elections and um, American politics. Um, for the Q&A, if you can put questions in the Q&A tab that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, that would be great. I'll then uh, pose those uh, during our Q&A uh, after the presentations. If you have any technical issues, please, um, uh, uh, you can put them in the chat to let us know you're having, having any trouble. And I think that's all uh, to get us going. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Peter um, and then to Lynn and then to Nate. Thanks so much. Dave, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm sorry I'm not out in Berkeley. I have to admit I'm in Washington, DC but it's marvelous to be with all of you and always a pleasure to uh, be part of Jack Citrin uh, forums because they're special and his career has been special. Uh, let's flip to the first slide because uh, we might as well, uh, we might as well uh, accept it for what it is. Uh, this is the tar and feathering quadrennial event for pollsters. Uh, and so I thank, thank you for the invitation uh, and it's a much classier group than I had in 2016. Uh, let me turn to the question of the day, and that is, what happened with the pollsters? Where did it go wrong uh, in this? And to be honest, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, to be, we need to dig a lot deeper. But uh, in my estimation, we've been doing the NBC Wall Street Journal poll that I do it with 
uh, the uh, Republican uh, counterpart for public opinion strategy, uh, Bill McIntyre. And uh, I think the first thing I'd say is the polls failed to represent the electorate that was growing. Uh, we missed uh, those who were engaged and enraged. And that was an important element in terms of uh, uh, post-2016 that we talked about what happened in the last campaign, but there was a growing uh, number of people. And if you looked at the final crowd that the president had of 75,000 people in uh, Butler County, it's a pretty good example of how strong his support was. In addition, uh, everybody talked about the shy Trump voter. Uh, I have to tell you, and going back over our own data, I don't think that holds true. We may have missed groups, and we'll talk about that, uh, particularly in what ha was happening in the Latino community. But uh, there was consistent answers by people in terms of where they were coming from and the fact that they were voting for Trump. They weren't shy. And you can see a consistency in answers uh, there. And then the other two things that I want to mention, one is I think the micro campaign that the president ran uh, helped to change the balance of the electorate. And indeed, I think that if the macro message went to Biden's advantage, I think the micro work of the Trump campaign uh, made the composition of the electorate different and that threw off what we had. And the last thing I want to say in the uh, final analysis is, this is a business that I've been in for 56 years. And I'm wondering if we're on borrowed time. And when I say that, uh, over the years, the respondent participation has dropped so dramatically. And while we may not see it in commercial research or in general public opinion research, Obviously, when it comes to election, uh, a big part of this is who's willing to respond. And when we're down at uh, five, six percent of the American public who are willing to take the polls, how accurate and how on target can you be? So that's the broad sense. Let me talk quickly about uh, what we see in terms of the election. Uh, let me start right here. Uh, so little change, but so much happened. If you look at this, we go back to the Obama-Trump counties, those counties that Obama carried in uh, 2012 and in 2016, Donald Trump carried. And if you look, there really was almost very little change. Uh, of the 135 electoral votes, 108 stayed uh, in the president's uh, corner, and only 27, uh, only 27 electoral votes uh, switched uh, in terms of where things went in terms of the counties. So uh, those counties uh, were swing counties. They moved in the right direction. If you go back to the next slide, basically uh, here, just switched, uh, great. Uh, over the past 40 years, we've had 19 counties who have voted as bellwethers uh, for all of these elections. If you look at this election, 18 of the 19 counties all disappeared and went in the direction of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, rather than suggesting that somehow uh, this represents greater polarization, I think it goes back to uh, the work that was done previously where people talked about Cracker Barrel uh, counties and they all voted uh, for Trump and the whole food counties all voted for uh, Biden or uh, for Biden and Hillary Clinton in 2016. Here, I think what you see is a coalescing of the different social forces and consequently, it's the changing of the guard and where the country's at. Let me go to the next uh, slide if I can and just make a quick point about the issues. This is from our October poll and we asked voters to tell us uh, who did they prefer on each of the following issues. And if 10 items, nine of the 10 uh, were all, uh, were all uh, Joe Biden uh, favored. But you look at this, this was not an election 
on issues as far as I was concerned. It was really much more on style and personality. And if you look at the bottom, uh, there are uh, three items that I think tell us an awful lot. One obviously is dealing with race relations, which were uh, very much front and center in this campaign. The second had to do with two personality elements. One is temperament and the other was uh, ability to, uh, to relate to women. I think it is those elements where there was a 30, uh, 30 plus point lead for uh, Joe Biden, which helped to uh, change the balance of power. I don't believe that it was as much on any of the individual issues. In the half a century, uh, you know, we have never seen something like this uh, super trifecta. And uh, you have to go all the way back to 1968 when essentially you had a recession, change in the Supreme Court, mass protests, a war, and a pandemic. And in 1968, we all remember uh, Vietnam. We remember the, uh, the racial unrest and uh, the protest that was going on. And that election turned out to be an exceptionally close election uh, between Humphrey and Nixon. If you look, the other years had parts of this, but this was so much like 1968. And in 68, essentially, the incumbent uh, lost, if you say it's Lyndon Johnson, in his case, Hubert Humphrey, and in 2020, which obviously Donald Trump loses. So the change is there, but the change was narrow, which leads us to the next chart, which is, again, so much happened and so little change. If you look at the difference, uh, essentially under 40,000 votes in 2016, and if they moved from Trump to Clinton, Clinton would have been the president. And in 2020, it's the same number of votes, 38,992 versus 38,874. And the change here, if those had happened, Donald Trump would have won this election. So we think of this as a cataclysmic change, but you can see in these three states, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, the change is so narrow and the change is, uh, is so large. Finally, let me talk about one other thing, and that is what comes out of this election. And there's been a lot that we've heard over the past few days, but essentially what you see over a period of time are the coattails uh, that have existed in other elections and how they have produced major change and the situation that we have in terms of uh, Biden in 2020, which is tough sledding on the legislative front. And I think others will talk about this, but it gives you a sense that there weren't coattails. It was, as we say, an Eisenhower jacket. Uh, the wind was narrow and the change was slight. And finally, uh, let me just take this one last question. And that is the way in which the voters looked at this election uh, in a sort of rock, scissor, pa uh, paper kind of child game. Uh, it was coronavirus, uh, which was really the dominant element. Uh, in all of this, what we saw are two things. Number one, uh, the switch in terms of the way the voters looked at it and the importance of it in terms of the country. When they talked about their individual lives, they talked about the economy, but truly in terms of the dynamic that was playing out. The second thing that we saw in terms of all of this is the importance of the first debate, because the first debate essentially allowed the voters to be able to make the choice that they wanted. It was a terrible debate for Donald Trump. Uh, he was choosing to try and upend uh, Joe Biden. But in reality, what the voters saw, as I like to put it, is enough already for Donald Trump and Joe Biden turned out to be good enough. And in the end, that's how this election looked from my perspective. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. So now we'll turn it over to Lynn. Yeah, okay. I was just gonna say, I think that I am up next. 
So I am gonna share some slides as well. Thanks so much for, um, for having me. Uh, and um, I'm gonna pick up on a lot of the themes that Peter just talked about and um, focus in on what we know about people who were switching votes in this cycle. So this is really hot off the presses here from my dining room table. Um, you're gonna sort of get a sense of um, how I'm working through this in real time. So um, echoing what Peter said, I also take the view that 2020 looks a lot like 2016 in many of the ways that Peter just talked about. It's very close. It's a narrow victory. Big shifts from the previous election are also a part of what's going on in the similarity between 16 and 20. But in 2020, the shifts are a little bit different. And so I wanna think about what those shifts look like from 2016 to 2020. And so I call those transitions, people who are switching their votes. So I'm explicitly here not going to account for changes in turnout. I'm just thinking about voters who voted for, say, Donald Trump in 2016 and switched their vote to uh, Joe Biden in 2020, or the opposite. They voted for Clinton and they switched to Trump. So that's the kind of transition or switching that I'm talking about. The data that I'm going to show you are mostly from a project I've been running called Nationscape. And um, we've been interviewing 6,250 people a week, every week. We have done that since July of 2019, and we will continue until Inauguration Day. So at the end of it, we'll have over 500,000 interviews. The goal was to have about 1,000 interviews in every congressional district in the country. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're hoping to do, is be able to tell the story about uh, the nation as a whole. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I'm gonna show you a lot of relationships here that are related to people switching because my survey data is asking people questions all at the same time. So I, this is not a panel. I haven't interviewed everyone a year ago and then re-interviewed them today. Um, all of the analyses that I'm showing you are going to show associations, but not necessarily causality. And so we'll talk about what that means as I work through it. Okay, so I just wanna start with a quote. We asked some of our Nationscape voters who were switchers. We asked them why they switched their vote. And um, this is one of my favorite things that someone wrote back to us. Once upon a time I had hope, we all did, but eventually hope dies only to be reborn as desperation. And what I kind of like about this is it's kind of impossible to know which transition this person is making. So this is also following on what Peter said about uh, the enraged and engaged people. Um, you know, don't really know what hope has died and, and what uh, has led to desperation for this voter, but this is a sense of what made them change their vote. Okay, so let's think a little bit about these transitions. How many people actually do this, change their vote? Uh, what I'm showing you here is a basic transition table um, from your vote in 2016 to 2020. And like I said, this isn't a panel, so these are people telling me who they voted for in 2016. It would be a lot better if I had interviewed all you know, 200,000 of these people in 2016 or 17, and then could re-interview them now, but I don't have that. So I ask people, who did you vote for in 2016? And who are you gonna vote for? Or did you vote for in 2020? And you read this table down the columns. So conditional on having voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, 96% of those Clinton voters say that they're sticking with Biden. So she's um, he is holding on to a lot of that Clinton vote, only 4% peeling off. In this column, in the Trump column, conditional on having voted for Trump in 2016, only 91% are saying that they're going to continue to vote for Trump. So the 9% here are peeling off to vote for Joe Biden. So these cross diagonal elements are the real interesting ones. This is the loss from the previous election. And you can see that Trump is losing more voters than Joe Biden is losing, so to speak, the, the Clinton-Biden voters um, from 16 to 20. So that's these are the people we're talking about when we go into these next tables. We're talking about these um, switchers. 
Okay, so now I want to, I study campaign messaging. And so I'm always interested in trying to figure out whether what the candidates said and did in the campaign had any kind of correspondence to what the actual outcome of the election was. And so I, to, to sort of start to give myself a gut sense of this, I make tables like this. And I'm gonna show you tables related to party. What role does party play in the switching? To COVID, I'm gonna show you some about identity politics. And then we won't talk very much about the economy. Um, Gabe's gonna talk about that a little bit later. So I'm gonna leave a lot of that to him. And then at the end, I'll just talk a little bit about geography. Okay, so partisanship. First thing, not, not rocket science here, partisans are coming home. That's the pattern we're gonna see. This is not surprising. But independents are an interesting category and they're gonna switch to Biden more than they switch to Trump. So let's see what that looks like. I'm gonna show you a lot of tables that look like this next one. So I'll take a minute to unpack what this is. So these are Clinton voters who are either going to stay with Biden. So the top row is always gonna be the stayers. These are the people sticking with their party or these are Clinton voters who switched to Trump. The bottom row is always gonna be the switchers. Okay, and then across the top part of these tables, I'm gonna put the thing I'm looking at and I'm gonna tell you the percent of people in this category among the voters we're talking about. So this means that Republicans made up 6% of the Clinton coalition. Right? Democrats made up 89%. That makes sense, right? She's a Democrat. Most of her votes are coming from Democrats. And you can see not too many Democrats switch to vote for Donald Trump or tell us that they're going to switch, but being a Republican is associated with switching to Trump. So if you're a Republican Clinton voter in 2016, 31% of those people are saying, I'm gonna switch. If you're an independent Clinton voter in 2016, it's 5%, not that much of the coalition, but 5%, 10% are switching to Trump. So this is the within party um, coming home, right? Republicans coming home to Trump. And then this is the independent number, 10%. So now let's look at that same table, but for Trump 2016 voters and see how they look. So not surprisingly, most of Trump's 2016 voters are Republicans and most of them are staying with him. This number is bigger, the 5%, than the Democrat number, uh, the Clinton voters um, switching to uh, Trump. So, so Trump is losing more of his in-party than Biden was losing. But look over here, among the Democrats, so 8% of Trump's coalition call themselves Democrats today. Okay, and among those people, almost half of them are saying, I'm going to switch to Joe Biden. Okay, so now this can be a little bit conflated. Maybe these people didn't think they were Democrats when they voted for Trump in 2016. So we don't want to make a lot out of this, but saying that you're a Democrat today who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 is highly associated with switching to Biden. And the independent number is just twice as big. It's the same share. It was 5% of Clinton voters, it's 5% of Trump voters, but more than double the share are switching to Biden. So in terms of partisanship, they're mostly holding on to their party voters, but Biden is, is picking up more of these party switchers than Trump is. Okay, COVID concern, what does that tell us? 87% of Americans on average are very or somewhat concerned with COVID. So this is a widespread concern for everybody in the country. That concern is associated with switching, but it is disproportionately associated with switching to Biden. So let's look at what that looks like. So these are Trump voters and I'm showing you how concerned they are about COVID. So more than half of Trump voters, well, well more than half, are very or somewhat concerned about COVID. Okay, and among people who voted for Trump in 2016 and tell us they're very concerned about COVID today, 15% of those people are switching from Trump to Biden. Among those who are somewhat concerned, 6%. Now these are big shares, right? 15% of 46%. Um, so there's a lot of switching happening here because 
of concern about COVID or along with, let's say, concern about COVID. Not very many of the folks who aren't concerned are moving to Biden. So this suggests to me as someone who's interested in, in campaign messaging and what might have been driving election outcomes, that concern about COVID is a player in this story. And we have to put COVID in the column of potential um, drivers of interest. When we look at the transitions the other way, so let's look at Clinton voters and their COVID concern, you can see again that because everybody's concerned, most Clinton voters are also very or somewhat concerned about COVID today. And those people are not moving that much to Trump, but among the Clinton voters who say they're not concerned today, those people are associated with movements to Trump. Okay, now these are big numbers, but these are not. So in terms of the total number of votes that this is um, delivering, it is many fewer than the votes from Trump to Biden because people are concerned about COVID. Okay, so this is just more evidence to me that COVID is something that's going to help us structure how we think about the outcome. Okay, so now what about identity politics, this idea of systemic racism? Uh, Peter talked about the crime and safety and law and order. So there's a longstanding body in political science that measures these symbolic uh, ideas of racism and prejudice. And we measure that with a longstanding set of measures called racial resentment. The main idea behind these measures is this question, does racial inequality stem from discrimination or from a lack of effort on the part of the black community. And so what I wanna know, I'm gonna take one of these questions that I think illustrates this really well. I wanna know, do racial attitudes, are they associated with switching in 2020? So Clinton voters, transitions, this is the question that I'm gonna show you. Generations of slavery and discrimination have created conditions that make it difficult for blacks to work their way out of the lower class. And survey respondents can either agree or disagree with that statement. Now, because it's a little hard to keep straight, I've got this little um, ruler, this little cheat sheet ruler on the bottom. If you agree with this statement, if you're over here, then you're saying, yes, I think systemic racism is, is playing a role in inequality. If you're over here, you disagree, you're saying, no, I don't think, I don't think that it's slavery and discrimination. Okay, so you can see here among Clinton voters, most of them are on this side of the scale and most of them are sticking with Joe Biden. But if you strongly disagree, so if you think that systemic racism has nothing to do with racial inequality in the country, 11% of those people are saying they're switching to Trump. Okay, so some evidence of maybe this is helping to structure how people are moving, but let's look at Trump voters. And you can see a little bit of more of a pattern here. So among Trump 2016 voters who agree in some fashion that slavery and discrimination are, response, are more responsible for racial inequality in the country. And, and that's not just a couple people, you know, that's nearly a third of his 2016 voters, those people are moving to Joe Biden. Um, so these beliefs are associated with a Biden vote. And now again, I just wanna be clear that I'm measuring these two things at the same time. Okay, so we, we have to be careful here in saying that one thing is coming before the other. They could all be moving at the same time, but the fact that, that this association is happening among Trump 2016 voters is interesting to me as I think about what might have been shaping um, the outcome of this election. Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna show you is just a little bit about um, the county level Hispanic and black votes for Donald Trump. You've heard a lot about this in the news. We're gonna look at counties in the, some battleground states and see if there's a relationship between movements uh, toward tr Trump from 2016 to 2020. So again, this is about changes from 16 to 20 um, and how many Hispanic or black voters are living in these counties. So the first picture is for the, the percent of Hispanic um, citizen, uh, citizen voters in the population and the change in Trump vote margin from 16 to 20. And I'm 
the plotting symbols here are counties. The size of the circle is the size of the county. The solid line is just a line of best fit through the plotting symbols, but you wanna be looking at the dashed line. So the dashed line takes account of the size of the counties, how big or small they are. So looking at the dashed lines, positive relationships tell us that an increase in the percent Hispanic in a county is leading to an increase in Trump's margin. Okay, and this is the result that you've heard talked about so much in the last couple of days. And that's happening in Arizona, in California, in Florida, uh, New Mexico, Nevada, and then here's Texas. One thing I'll point out as you're looking at this, the scales on these axes are not the same. So um, it's just worth thinking about here in, in Texas, this this vertical axis is so much bigger than it is, for example, in Nevada or New Mexico or Arizona. So the line may not look as steep, but it's covering a lot more territory. So in Texas, these are the counties that everyone has been talking about um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And you can see what everyone is, is talking about. These, this is the margin. So anything above 40 here is a 40 point change in the margin toward Trump in these counties. But this general relationship is happening across, across states. You do not see the same pattern when you look at the counties in terms of the percent of their population that's Black. And um, Pennsylvania here is the one exception. But these relationships with the Trump margin they are maybe positive in Georgia and Michigan, um, maybe negative here in Ohio. That might be worth um, thinking about declines in the Trump margin, um, but not the kinds of relationships that you see with the Hispanic um, vote in the counties. And I think, as, as Peter said, it's a little too early to really know uh, what's going on. But some of that work that I did showing you the transition tables um, might be helpful here and thinking about uh, the Latino or Hispanic vote and the way it's changing, you know, it, it could be that um, some of this is about partisanship and 2008 and 12 were really unique elections uh, with Barack Obama on the ticket. And um, a, some of this might be partisans coming home after those two elections, uh, could be COVID related and jobs related. Uh, so I think that um, it's worth thinking about these transitions in the same way that we're thinking about overall transitions in the country, but we'll have to do a lot more work before we um, know exactly what to say about that. So um, I'm just going to present three different ways of visualizing the results of this election that uh, I do a pretty much every, something like this every year to help make sense of the results. Um, and uh, if you could go on to the next slide, Stephanie, and then the next one too. Uh, and the first way is to look at stability and change uh, at the state level. Um, and to start that off and to give you a sense for uh, what to expect here, uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, here is the change between the 72 presidential election and the 76 uh, presidential election. So we have Nixon, 72 vote percentage as the x-axis and Ford uh, as the 76 uh, percent there. And if every state between these two elections voted roughly the same way, we would see all the states nicely lining up on that 45 degree line. Uh, and as you can see in this year, there were or these elections, there was essentially no relationship between how people voted for Nixon and how they voted for, for Ford. Um, voters looked at the pairs of candidates in these two years and uh, thought that they were very different, um, uh, very different individuals. Um, and probably the greatest change occurs in Georgia for uh, reasons that, that my hunch is most people could, uh, could guess there. So if you um, uh, go to the next uh, slide. Um, so here uh, is what this pattern looked like for Romney in 2012 compared to Trump in 2016. Um, and uh, as you can see on the, um, 
Uh, unlike what happened with uh, um, in 72 and 76, almost all the states very closely line up on that uh, dotted line. Um, and it's almost like voters uh, looked at Romney um, and uh, Trump and said, ah, these candidates look the same to us. And that's, that's when I first saw this plot, I remember thinking that's pretty extraordinary because uh, most people think of these two candidates as about as different as you could get on many dimensions. Um, and as everyone knows, they, they appear to be at loggers ends uh, on so many things. Um, and the only state that did seem to notice that somebody else was on the ticket was Utah. Um, so of course, uh, where Romney lives um, and uh, uh, where many of his co-religionists uh, live. And um, uh, if you switch to the next slide, so here is the results for the current, current election on the y-axis and then Trump in 2016 on the x-axis. And uh, what you see in this pattern is pretty much more of the same. Voters had four more years of Trump and at the state level, they appear to have uh, not change their opinions at all about um, about Trump uh, with four years to learn uh, learn about him. And these are all calculated as uh, Trump percent of all votes cast. And so one pattern that you can see, um, uh, which came up a bit already in various remarks, is that Trump seems to have done on average better uh, across most states in this election than he did in the last election. His vote share has gone up on average um, across states. And we can talk more about why that, uh, that is, um, um, but it's you know, in part because uh, um, uh, of a surge in Republican turnout. There was a surge in Democratic turnout too, but more of one among Republicans. Um, and so how did Biden manage to win this election? Well, uh, because um, there was even more of a, a shift towards, um, towards Biden relative to, to Clinton in, in 2016. Um, new, we, this, is, this data is as of yesterday, so we still haven't finished counting in some states. New York will probably come down closer to that line, as will California. But there are a bunch of states that moved up. Um, a bunch of people have, uh, I've seen have noted uh, Hawaii um, has shifted more towards uh, Trump and they've um, more or less finished counting there, uh, which is a, fasc a fascinating pattern. And one of the reasons why I like these sorts of plots so much is that um, a lot of the interest and commentary is rightly so on shifts that affect pivotal states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Arizona, Georgia, and you can see all those states right in the, right in the middle there. Um, but their shifts since the last election are really, really small. Now those small movements really matter, but they're really small. And what these plots allow you to sort of do is step back and look at the electorate at the whole. And that electorate of the whole seems not to have noticed the changes in candidates over the last few years, um, uh, which is fascinating. And uh, it's hard to tell an ideological story that would make sense of that. Both Trump and Romney are kind of unusual candidates in that regard. Um, both have you know, made shifts. Romney was a moderate from um, Massachusetts to some extent. Um, but it's hard to argue that Wyoming and West Virginia and Oklahoma are voting for these candidates because of their somewhat mixed uh, um, uh, ideological positions, policy positions in the in the past, and likewise, you know, Massachusetts and Vermont uh, so consistently voting on the other other side. Um, uh, you can see um, uh, Alaska hasn't finished counting there. We'll have to see what happens with that. And Utah, um, uh, Utah has moved sort of back to some extent into the fold after the uh, four years. But for everybody else, it's sort of more or less uh, the same. And I think that's consistent with. Um, uh, strong partisanship on the part of uh, most uh, most voters um, that probably is tied up with cosmopolitanism and urban versus rural divides that you see reflected so well when you look across uh, the patterns of these states. 
All right, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. So now just to put this loss in perspective really quickly, um, in this next plot, um, here are how incumbent uh, presidents have fared relative to their uh, major party opponent back to the first election for which we have vote counts, which is uh, John Quincy Adam. Um, and uh, 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 so higher numbers here mean that the president has done better relative to their opponent. And you can see the sort of FDR and LBJ and Reagan and Nixon landslides uh, sort of up there. And then at the very end, you can see Donald, uh, Donald J. Trump, um, DJT, um, with a small, probably will end up being somewhere around a five or six point um, negative margin uh, for Trump in this, this election. And the main reason to show this plot is just to show that, say that uh, in general, incumbent presidents have tremendous advantages when they go into reelection. On average, over US history, they've won by something like 11, 12, points. Um, and so relative to that, Trump's loss is, is, uh, um, uh, is big. Um, it's not as big as some, uh, but it's, you know, it's a long way from how well incumbent presidents typically do. And the one caveat to that is we are in a highly polarized time. Um, and you can see in other polarized times in the U.S., margins of incumbents tend to be a bit lower as well. Um, so, you know, why the loss? Um, well, just the one last thing I'll, I'll uh, show you on that front is just a brief plot on the economy that myself and my uh, co-authors uh, made. Um, and this is uh, um, from work uh, with Eric Gunterman, uh, who's a great postdoc here, and Jeff Myers, who's a, a, a undergrad, former Berkeley undergrad, um, now working in the campaign room. And in the top plot here, we have all uh, incumbent residents uh, who were eligible to run all the way back to George Washington. You can see one of George Washington's right on the uh, dash line that goes through the middle of the plot. Um, and then in the next panel, the middle panel below that, you can see here are the candidates that chose to run a game. Um, and then finally, you can, at the bottom, you can sort of imagine this is kind of like a funnel. Here are the ones that actually made it and won uh, if they did run a game. And on the x-axis, we have election year GDP growth, um, which we found some economists had pushed this all the way back to George Washington, um, which allowed us to make this very cool, uh, very cool plot. And the first thing to note on this plot is that um, you see a hollowing out of the candidates that choose to run where you go from the top panel down to the middle panel when GDP growth is around zero or below zero. So right around zero, you see Washington, Jackson, Polk, Coolidge, all decided not to seek a or go seek another term um, when they uh, when GDP growth was uh, was close to zero, and Washington, in some of his letters, complained bitterly about feeling unpopular in his eighth year because of the recession that was occurring in the U.S. And uh, you also, um, and then in the next plot, you see that only two presidents through the whole history of our country have managed to win with negative growth. And Donald J. Trump, DJT, is around 3.5 uh, on this plot. And I just threw that in there because it's the sort of current consensus forecast of GDP growth for the US in the election year. Who knows if that'll end up being the sort of uh, what, we, what we end up on. Um, but um, both the two presidents that won, Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, are cases that seem to prove the rule. Lincoln won uh, despite a recession on the back of major Civil War victories and what looked like it was close to the end of the war. Teddy Roosevelt uh, ran um, or won on the back of uh, booming growth in the fall. Uh, the economy really was booming again in September and October um, and uh, probably helped them win the election. So uh, Donald J. Trump appears to be another president that fits with this pattern. Of course, we don't know if this is why he lost. It's a very unusual year for the economy and for income growth for people. But it's certainly in general a very hard thing to do is win the presidency um, uh, with a uh, declining economy and it may help explain what's uh, 
going on there. Um, so I think that, um, oh, that's the end of my slides. And I think we have um, uh, Nate back whose system yes. cra crashed um, right as Lynn was finishing. And so I'll uh, gladly turn it over to you. I don't know what Lynn's scintillating last sentence was, but it totally crashed my system to the point where I had to actually get another computer in order to uh, do my presentation. So um, uh, whatever, you know, I have that effect on a lot of technology, whatever, Nate. What'd you say? <laughs> I have that effect on a lot of technology. You know, I was going to say, whatever hot take you had was so hot that it threw <laughs> my system. So um, I'm principally going to talk about the election administration issues with this election. Um, and then I'll end by talking about the litigation and where we are. Um, but let me, let me, um, I'll also talk a little bit about um, some of the, the, where we are on, on people's trust in the election uh, and the like. So let me just share my screen also and um, um, start there. All right. Um, so let me move the, this also, okay. So when I, so I'm, I'm director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, and most of what I've done over the last six, seven years has been to focus on issues of how, you know, uh, digital democracy and the effect of Facebook on uh, elections uh, and the like. Um, but in, in February or March, when the pandemic's effect on the election became apparent, um, I, along with Charles Stewart, uh, decided to start this project called the Healthy Elections Project, which you can see at healthyelections.org. <clears throat> the um, and so we, I dropped sort of all the internet stuff that I've been doing and, and switched to talk to think about these issues, putting on the hat that I used to wear when I was the research director of the President's Commission on Election Administration. That was the commission that under Obama, which was a bipartisan commission that dealt with things like long lines on election day, um, natural disasters in voting, voting technology and the, and the like. We, we did not have on our agenda um, pandemics in voting. But um, uh, we had, Charles and I had built a lot of relationship with local election officials and felt that we, you know, there needed to be some kind of effort to, to deal with the election administration problems of the pandemic. And it's important to understand how bad things were in the primaries, if you turn back the clock seven months, that we, we were, it's fair to say that the system was melting down and that you had, for example, in the, in the Wisconsin primary, due to a host of factors, um, you had 97% of the polling places in Milwaukee not opening on the primary day. You had, uh, you know, even later in the summer with New York, where 20% of the absentee ballots in New York City ended up not being counted because of errors. And so um, as, as difficult as this post-election period is, and as critical as people are about um, the performance, uh, imagine what would have happened if the kind of problems that we saw in the primary period happened on election day. Um, my bottom line is going to be that the election administrators did an unbelievable job in this election, truly Herculean, uh, that, that they were able to pull off uh, this election under these circumstances with very, very few problems. Okay. So what was the problem that the pandemic posed to the election, which was how do you basically shift tens of millions of voters away from the way of voting that they have historically been um, experiencing? And you know the, the solutions, as we say in, in um, the election administration field, this is not rocket surgery, right? You needed to move people to um, mail wherever you could, and then to retrofit the existing polling places. But that's not as easy as most people think. The idea of just mailing everyone a ballot, which some states like California and New Jersey and others, Vermont did, uh, along with the existing vote by mail states, that really different states are differently situated in order to do that. Um, and what we saw in this election was that the, between these two poles of um, of, of mail balloting on the one hand and, and in-person voting on the other. There were a lot of intermediary options, a lot of what we've talked about with, um, uh, 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 a lot of what we've done with uh, ballot drop boxes and the like. Um, so, oh. 
what were the constraints that were that were placed on the process? Um, obviously, time and money. Um, time turned out to be more important. Um, Congress appropriated four hundred million dollars. We got a comparable amount from private philanthropy. So you saw something this time that you'd never seen before, where you had probably 400, 300, certainly $300 million from the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, probably another 100 million or so of private money actually going into public coffers to try to run the election. Um, and so money, I think in the end was not as big an obstacle as, as some might've thought. And I think it's actually a challenge now in Georgia on how they're gonna both do their recount and, and run their, their new election. Um, but uh, time was of the essence. And uh, we need more time to vote, more time to count the votes, obviously, as we're seeing now, more time to run the election. Um, what that money did go toward, though, was to sort of people, places, and things, right? That we needed uh, new poll workers, we needed new polling places, um, we needed PPE, stuff that we really, really had never had to deal with in an election administration environment, which was made all the more difficult by the structural impediments to election reform in the US, the incredible decentralization of our election system down to 50 states and then down to 10,000 local jurisdictions, um, a contracting and procurement and regulatory process, which was not well situated to make these kinds of changes. That, for example, most notably now, just the inability to move, um, to start the counting of votes earlier, which would have saved a lot of the headaches that we're seeing in places like Pennsylvania. Um, but but uh, because there had not been um, you know, the number of absentee ballots in those states had never been so great that they had ill-fitted regulations for, for this kind of um, this kind of election. Of course, the partisanship and polarization over election administration, which we're seeing in full force right now, um, uh, pre-existed the election. And, and so Donald Trump's um, admonitions about fraud and absentee balloting, you know, started early in the summer. Um, I'll say this, which is when you deal with the local election officials, you do not see the kind of partisanship and polarization on these infrastructural questions that you do with um, when you look at it at the national level. But finally, one of the biggest problems is just the unpredictability of the virus and how you prepare for an election when you don't know how willing people are going to be uh, to, to go out and vote. Now, in some ways, what was happening in this election in the move to uh, greater mail balloting was something that was long in coming so that we had, um, you know, 25% uh, uh, or so of, of voters who had historically been voting early that then um, shifted quite a bit in this election. Um, but it didn't, you know, it shifted in, in differential uh, rates in depending on which state we're talking about. Um, as you probably know, and I'll have another slide that, that will show this, right, we had roughly 155 to 159 million people who ended up voting in this election, over 101 million uh, ended up voting early. Um, and so that's a massive shift from what, we'd, what we had seen previously. Um, different states, as I said, were differently situated. Most of the states, though, fell into this gray area here where you can see um, states that allowed for no excuse absentee balloting as opposed to full on uh, vote by mail. Um, that's why the, the conflict and the, and the um, issues surrounding mail balloting were quite um, strange in a lot of ways because the president was, uh, was content with how Florida uh, did its absentee uh, voting system. And that's really the issue, you know, the same system that was at work in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina and the like. Um, but as you, just to give you a sense of that, how difficult it was to make the shift that was uh, necessary, I've highlighted the battleground states here. And you can see that for places like North Carolina and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where you had roughly, you know, 5% rates and Georgia, 5% rates of uh, absentee balloting, they were then kicked up to 40 to 50%, much more difficult as compared to a place like Arizona when almost 80% um, of their previous balloting was um, uh, done by mail and California where it's about two thirds. Um, challenges to vote by mail, obviously, you know, we're seeing it play out in litigation right now. Huge, we're seeing Republicans in particular believe uh, you know, that, that the mail ballot system is incredibly fraudulent. I'll have some more data on that. Um, but that also historically there had been, you know, considerable bias in, in who had voted by mail. Um, and it was really important that we had enough polling places to pull off this election. And the jurisdictions really stepped up 
you, you did not see long lines at polling places, except really in early voting, right? And so Georgia and early voting, you saw some, but for the most part on election day, you didn't see any. Um, um, and the challenges to creating safe polling, polling places, like I said, people, places, and things, we had to recruit an entire army of poll workers because the average age of a poll worker in the US is 60 years old. Uh, NGOs like powerthepolls.org really stepped up. Um, as well as people who are contributing, you know, large facilities like the NBA did um, for, um, uh, you know, our arena voting and the like, as well as a lot of corporate involvement on um, PPE and the like. All right, let me let me move a little bit to just some data and then where we are today. So. Um, as I said, we've got a roughly 158 to 159 million people who uh, turned out to vote, um, about 36 million who voted early in person, 65 million voted by mail, 57 million who voted uh, in person on November 3rd. This is the highest turnout of the eligible voter population in over 112 years. Um, we don't even really know how accurate the 1908 uh, statistics would be. Um, since that was an election which really did have some fraud in it. But even so, the electorate was much smaller uh, and because women were not allowed to vote um, in most states. And so, uh, you know, a two-thirds projected turnout uh, is, is truly extraordinary given the um, headwinds that, that voters and election officials were both uh, facing, right? And you can see where we are uh, as compared to, to previously here. And generally speaking, you saw that across the board, this increase in turnout. Um, not, you know, it's not, um, they, they had sort of different baselines, uh, but, but that you saw uh, turnout growing uh, everywhere in competitive states and non-competitive states and the like. Um, and it, you know, you saw record turnout in all but seven states, uh, uh, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Mississippi. Uh, and then some states like Texas, and the, these others actually exceeded 100% of their 2000, 2016 turnout um, by election day, right? So just the early voting period itself uh, was enough, okay? Um, I'll just say, as I said, that so the final stats, as it looks like, that, that roughly 21% uh, voted early in person, roughly 37% voted by mail, and roughly uh, 43% uh, voted on election day. Um, one of the interesting things, and this comes from North Carolina, is that not only did people vote, of course, in record numbers by mail, but the um, you see a different pattern in this election than maybe you've seen historically, and you see that people requested their ballots um, early and they returned them for the most part early. Uh, and the, the, the message had gone out that um, that you needed to you make sure that your, your vote was uh, returned early and before it to be counted. Uh, sometimes you see this where, where the absentee ballot requests actually go up over time and then um, the returns uh, also um, uh, go up. But you can see that most people got them in uh, well, you know, at least a week before, if not more. Um, interestingly, it looks like the late returners might have been, uh, our, our, our sort of Republicans over time were more likely to return their ballots uh, later. So some of these debates over the deadlines might actually have a disparate effect on uh, Republicans. We don't know, for example, in the, this three-day period after the election, whether um, uh, those votes in Pennsylvania that are going to be counted are actually more or less uh, Republican. Um, let me just go to, go to where where things are on, on on trust in the election, and then if I have time, I'll talk about litigation. I think I'm, I'm reaching the end here. Um, there is a big, it should not surprise people, right, that we have a a huge polarization in. Um, trust over this election. So after the election, you have Republicans, uh, um, large majority of them say they do not trust um, the result. Um, seven and 10 say that the uh, 2020 election was not free and fair. Uh, most of, uh, and, and that is, while there's always a gap between winners and losers um, in elections, uh, this is a 64 percentage point gap um, among between Democrats and Republicans as to whether they thought the election was uh, free and fair. Um, most of that is because of those who don't trust the election, mo a lot of it has to do with uh, a concern about mail uh, ballot fraud. 
not a huge uh, surprise there. Um, I'll just say that that uh, that this extends even uh, for states where where uh, which Trump won that you see this partisan gap again not not terribly surprising, uh, and then um, one of the interesting things as I just segue to talk about the lawsuits is that most people even including a plurality of Republicans don't expect uh, the results to be overturned. Um, with that, let me let me just quickly talk about the the lawsuits that we're seeing right now none of which I would think are going to lead to overturning of results, but um, many of which are feeding the frenzy of conspiracy theories about misdeeds in this election. Um, and so whether you're looking at Pennsylvania where there's a sort of large uh, lawsuit that was just filed uh, two days ago that'll be heard next week, um, or a similar lawsuit in Michigan, despite the fact that there's 150,000 vote margin between uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, uh, you have, if you go to our website, healthyelections.org and go to the litigation tracker, you can see all the lawsuits that have been uh, provided there. Um, and Georgia, obviously we've got a recount that is about to go on. And simultaneous to that, there was another lawsuit that was filed today, uh, calling into question the results throughout the state. And in each one of these lawsuits, there's some common themes, like that extensions of deadlines were unconstitutional, that the failure to have adequate observation uh, was uh, uh, illegal, um, that the state administrators have gone beyond the state statutes, creating a kind of problem that was litigated in Bush versus Gore, uh, and that also, uh, apropos Bush versus Gore, arguments about how local administrators in Democratic-leaning cities have made sort of done things so that the likelihood that votes would be counted there would be higher than in non-democratic cities. As I said, I would be surprised if any of these um, uh, tip flip the result. In order for this to make a difference, it would have to flip the result in three states, right? Um, um, to, to snag the electoral college, but um, they are contributing to this um, you know, climate of doubt over the election results. And it also is um, emboldening some politicians, particularly in state legislatures, who may want to take extreme measures like um, appointing electors themselves, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, but that that's where we are. Why don't I end there? And if anyone has questions on on any of that, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks so much, uh, Nate. And also thanks to Lynn and Peter for all that, uh, those great presentations. So we, um, please go ahead and put in questions um, in the uh, Q&A tab on the bottom bottom of your screen and they pop up and I think all the panelists can um, can see it. And um, uh, why don't we start um, with a, a question for uh, Peter, which is I think one that probably a lot of people are wondering about, which is um, why do we see such a, a difference between Trump approval uh, which was generally sort of low in, in the low 40s, and then Trump vote. He seems to have beaten his vote, his approval uh, noticeably. Um, and do we have any sense for how that happened, why that happened? Well, it, it's a really important question and a great question because over the course of, uh, of 60 years, you can look at the approval rating of the president, an incumbent president running for re-election. And it will be within two points to three points of, of what their final vote will be. And uh, there are some uh, differences when you have a three-person race. But even there, when you go back to uh, Bush in, uh, in the three-way race, uh, you can see uh, the correlation. And this election, I think we closed out with a number around 45% uh, was uh, Trump's job rating. So he did run a little higher. Uh, and I think going back to what I said originally, it is uh, the job that they did in the micro uh, area that they really had targeted uh, it so well in terms of uh, groups that would not have been with him, uh, such as Hispanics, uh, male vote, et cetera. And, but yet, uh, I think the, the variation is less off the job rating than it is uh, in terms of other factors. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, his job rating was, I think, only about uh, three to four points difference in the end. And do we have a sense for what what he was, what the messages were in that in those targeted um, uh, micro targeted messages, um, either for Peter or Lynn or or Nate? I guess by being micro, it's always, of course, hard to know. But I don't know the answer, so I'm hoping Peter knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Liz. Uh, I mean that in terms of the, of the messages, I mean it was uh, it was uh, essentially an extension of, of 2016, which was a difficult. Uh, uh, set of messages that he had to run on uh, because one case it was as an incumbent, the other he was the out candidate. So he never accepted any of the responsibilities. He only accepted everything was aimed at the negative towards the other person. It, it was amazing, but it tells you so much about the ability that he had over a four year period to, uh, to appeal to his base vote. And uh, indeed, uh, even when the policies were uh, detrimental, uh, those people followed him in almost a spiritual way, if you can say that. Uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was aggravation and irritation. And, uh, and the other side of it, of course, was the economy, good economic times. Uh, I wonder what would have happened in this election if there hadn't been COVID. Uh, it's hard to believe that the Democrats would have succeeded. Uh, and again, I, I felt that, uh, that Joe Biden did just enough to get through rather than necessarily people said, this, this is an agenda that I want to follow. And I think if we're projecting ahead instead of just looking at the election, Part of the challenge to him is going to be able to provide something that is that uh, direction, especially with a small uh, legislative base to work with. It will make a difference depending on what happens in Georgia. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, so the next question is actually one that I'm curious about and put to Lynn. Put to Lynn. Um, one, um, uh, We've seen all this evidence that the polls were wrong. And uh, Lynn had this really nice article and um, uh, also write up about it in the New York Times showing evidence that the coronavirus cases at the county level, I think it was or deaths at the county level, I think, mm -hmm. I can't remember which one that is. Um, yeah, it was deaths. Really do seem to hurt um, the president uh, at that level. And uh, Nate Cohen, who I know you work with at the New York Times, had this article up maybe yesterday, the day before, where he's like, well, I'm looking at the actual results and I don't see any relationship here. Um, and uh, maybe uh, that study and a lot of the other polling data we've all been working, working with here um, is sort of miss, missing the Trump voters. And that's why we found these relation, relationships um, now, I don't know how that would correlate with COVID deaths, but anyway, I thought it would be fascinating <laughs> to hear you weigh in about the sort of how much do we need to be worried about the bias in our surveys? And is there any way that Nate Cohen's right and that really, um, that could explain your that totally fascinating uh, uh, COVID mm -hmm. result? Yeah. So I think let's break that question out into two parts, which I think are quite different. The first is, should we be worried about um, this idea that we might be missing Trump voters. Yes, but the answer to that is just yes. Um, there will be a lot of work done in the next few months to a year trying to sort out why the adjustments that were made to try to make polling better actually seem to have increased the error. Um, and so there's just a lot to dig into there. And so that, that does need to get unpacked. Um, and the second part of your question is, could that, so there's actually maybe three parts, um, but then you asked, is it wrong that 
this relationship that Chris Warshaw and I had identified that uh, increasing COVID deaths in the last 30 days, so the, the rate at which deaths were increasing um, was leading people to vote less for Republicans. Is that wrong? Did that end up being wrong? And then the third part is, if it is wrong, is that somehow because of the polling data that we relied on? Sure. Um, so part one, like, should we be worried about the polling data and try to figure out what happened? Yes, absolutely, definitely have to do that. Part two is I'm not yet sure that, um, that, that, that the relationship we identified is wrong. What you've seen people talk about is, oh, hey, look, I went and looked at places that have more COVID deaths and those places didn't vote for Donald Trump. Um, and that's a that's a different finding than the one that we were talking about, which is that within a place, um, if deaths were going to increase, Trump was going to do less well than he otherwise would. And so it, it could still be true. You uh, somebody just said Peter, I think, just said that if this election happened without COVID, we're not sure that Joe Biden would have won. Um, and I, I completely agree with that. In fact, I, I almost think that he wouldn't have. Like, I don't even know about the not so sure part. Um, you know, I think COVID really restructured this race in, in a, an important way. And so it is possible that within counties, if you don't have the, the COVID related deaths and other things associated with that, that Trump would have done better than he actually did. Um, so those are two different things. And, and my co-authors and I will sort of get the real data and we'll try to do the best we can to sort that out. Um, now, you're also right that in order for us to make that argument, we have to have a change in sort of how people are um, going to vote. And we're using survey data in our piece to do that. What people are doing now is looking at 2016 vote to 2020 vote. Um, that's obviously going to be conflated with whole bunches of other things too, possibly, as you say, unrelated to how COVID is hitting. Um, but um, yeah, I think that um, it is a problem that the survey seem to under report Trump vote, but they're under reporting it pretty much everywhere. So it's a little bit like a clock that is off by 10 minutes, but all day long. Um, and so, you know, it, it, I'm not sure that the, the difference in difference kind of thing that we're doing um, is, is really, uh, you know, needs to be thrown out because of our clock is off by 10 minutes. Thanks, Lynn. Sorry for packing all those questions in there. <laughs> um, so uh, I know this is a question on a lot of people's minds and I can see it up here and it seems like a good question for Nate. So. Um, we have, uh, is it likely that states may instruct uh, electoral college electors to vote in a manner inconsistent with their states, uh, states votes? I can't imagine a better person to ask that question. <laughs> well, well, so let me rephrase the question because it's not that they will instruct the electors, it's that they will have different electors, right? So, so the way to think about this is what happens if there's a disputed election and you have competing slates of electors? And so for, so for me to explain that, I have to sort of give a, a, a little bit of um, what the path to the worst case scenarios would look like, right? So suppose that you have a situation in which, um, you know, that the, 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 take Pennsylvania where you had um, Biden's wins the legal fights and then is certified the victor by the uh, state, the secretary of state and the governor signs the certificate of the electors, right? And the electors meet. Um, simultaneous to that, you could have the state legislature appoint its own slate of electors um, that for President Trump and then send those essentially to the to Congress uh, to be opened on January 6th. So what do you do when you have two competing slates of electors? And the answer is that needs to be resolved by Congress. Mike Pence pr presides over that proceeding. And there's, you know, this is a normal vote um, between uh, the House and the Senate. Um, but the, I think it's unlikely that the state legislatures will appoint their own electors. First of all, like I said, you need two states to do something like that, given the 
what the margins are right now. Um, and it's not like it, it's just going to end there. There would be lots of litigation that would proceed and succeed that, whether it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court or otherwise. And we get into all kinds of novel um, legal issues about um, the Electoral Count Act, which was passed after the 1876 uh, presidential election controversy, um, and whether, in, which says that the certificate that's signed by the governor will be given presumptive status, and even before that says that um, if there is, and this was relevant to Bush versus Gore, if there's an election that takes place uh, based on procedures that were in existence before the election, that whoever wins that election will be the presumptive earner of those electoral college votes. So there's a lot of um, a lot of legal hoops one would have to jump through before the state legislature was able to appoint a separate slate of electors that was not uh, voted on by the people uh, uh, in the election. Thanks, that's very helpful. Um, so uh, another question that uh, or Steve Hayward has asked a couple of questions that I think are wor worth and I think are probably definitely on my mind, um, probably on others. Uh, how are exit polls done with so much early early voting here? And also, given the polling area error, would we expect the exit polls to have uh, a similar um, similar level of error? And I don't know if Peter or Lynn want to weigh in on either of those. But can I set them up a yeah. second and just say sure. how a complete disaster? I mean, the, the 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 exit polls that I've looked at, let alone the AP vote cast, are so divergent from each other. It's like we might as well just have made up numbers are are by ourselves. Now, look, the exit polls are always you reinterpret them based on what actually happened on the election, right? We all we all know that. But uh, the sheer divergence between the so-called exit polls, you know, in this election just tells you that they're, they're not terribly useful at this stage to make any assessments about what happened uh, in the election. Even just the, um, the preferences broken down by gender and race are wildly different between the two. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's, they need to be taken with a truckload of salt. Uh, so there's my, you know, there's my broad, uh, uh, broad side against it, but let me, defer to Peter who will know more. Uh, well, I don't disagree with what Nate says because exactly the same point. Uh, I've been doing the election night coverage either at CBS or NBC since 1964. Sorry to admit those ancient things, but uh, <laughs> indeed, uh, this was the first election where we were not in the studio. And I have to tell you that there was so much garbage that was coming in uh, that it was impossible to really make any, uh, any important insights. I mean, I worked with Chuck Todd uh, on election night, and uh, he, the material was just awful, and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but we've had situations uh, in Oregon and Utah where people vote by mail, and we've had successful surveys that we've done on uh, the weekend that helped us to understand and analyze those states. And in this instance, I have no idea, but uh, as uh, while the polls may come in for some criticism, I agree with Nate, this was a total, total disaster. Uh, I'll just jump in to say, to, to give some sense to the question um, asker, that the exit polls do try to account for early vote and mail vote. So um, a, a lot of the ways that that happens is the every state, since elections are administered in the United States by states, every state keeps a list of the registered voters within their state. Um, that state voter registration list is a matter of public record. So a person like me, a researcher, you know, I can go on the California Secretary of State's website right now and for $25, I can buy that list. Um, it doesn't say how a person voted, but it says that they're registered, who they are, that they're registered, often has a birth date, um, and shows which elections they voted in, not how they voted, but which ones they voted in. And so those lists are often the basis for learning who's voted early, what kinds, how many people, what, who do they, you know, what do they look like, um, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, they, they do, they are not ignoring that part. 
of um, the way it is, it's changed how people vote. They're trying to account for that. Now that's not to say that somehow this year it was done well, um, but, but they, are, they are making efforts. Yeah, I am. Um, just one other uh, story about that, which is just that this long history of the exit polls being pretty terrible at gauging the level. And I remember talking to some friends who work, work with the networks in their decision desks saying that from their view, it seemed like the networks didn't really care about the accuracy of the polls. They just really wanted good stories to be able to tell out of the cross tabs that they can generate from those. And there wasn't oh. a great deal of effort to get accuracy out of the uh, exit polls. And uh, I've conducted some of my own and it's, it's very hard for the research assistants to not want to talk to the sort of young, attractive people coming out of the exit polls and instead interview, you know, every 10th person or whatever, whatever, uh, whatever is going on on there. I also was re really struck by how hard it was to convince people who look like, um, you know, they had more blue collar jobs to talk to you. The sort of people who look like professionals, they knew what exit polls were and they were eager to chat with you. Like I remember being asked, am I gonna be on TV? Um, oh, and, Dave, yeah. Dave, I gotta just take you on on this because yeah. uh, I, 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 I find it uh, outrageous uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I started my career doing uh, work on the uh, election night coverage for CBS when I was at Lou Harris, and it was done by a combine, Lou Harris, IBM, and CBS all the way back in 1964. And if you go through the years, I mean, I think the exit polls and, more importantly, the vote profile analysis or whatever there were, have been exceptionally well done, but more important than that, I think they have provided exceptionally rich and important insights into the electorate. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened on this. And obviously with COVID, it made it more challenging. But I, I would tell you that over uh, a 40 and 50 year period, uh, that these polls have been invaluable in terms of understanding what voters are, why they're voting the way they are, who they are and what they're trying to say. And, uh, you know, people talk about winner bias and those kinds of things with polls, but on the exit polls, they are indeed uh, exceptionally, uh, exceptionally good and exceptionally helpful. So you have a different take, but I feel very strongly in the opposite. No, that's, so my sense, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that in at least since 2004, they generally haven't called the election correctly, uh, which doesn't mean they're not very informative about looking at relationships. Um, but am I, am I wrong about that? I don't you mean, I don't, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Sorry, I was going to say, Gabe, you don't, you don't mean like called it, you mean explained it. No, I mean, right? like, like if you look at the exit poll results, you'll lead to the wrong inference uh, about who's going to. Right, that's what I'm election. saying. Like, yeah. is it, you know, was it a, is it about soccer moms or yep. is it about yep. um, like the famous one, in, you know, 2004, yep. Yep. Um, you know, like, so, so that's, that's different than, than calling the outcome, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I just and then I'll yeah. throw it back to Peter in one second. But yeah, yeah. I guess I guess I want to I'm going to join the Peter pushback team just a tiny bit <laughs> um, and say that I, I don't think it's fair to say that that reporters and, and journalists don't care about being right. Um, you said they don't care about being right. They're more interested in a good story. Um, I think that they're interested in both of those things. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. They want the good story, but they, they want to be right. They definitely don't want to be wrong. The yeah. problem is that the thing that you're talking about, you know, was uh, the 2004 election about values voters, you know, when the exit poll had 15 categories for the economy and one category for values. So yeah, it's going to look like values outperforms the economy and you don't have to have a PhD to figure that out, but yet the narrative starts and it gets, and to be honest with you, that's a large reason why I started writing books about the outcomes of elections um, because we wanted to make sure that the right takeaways got inserted into the narrative. Um, 
But I, I think that if you think about the difference between, you know, the 1980s, the 1990s, early 2000s, and today, there's so much more data work being done in journalism today than there was 20 years ago. Yeah. That that and that is because they, you know, reporters want to be right. Um, they're curious people who want to know the truth. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, I, I don't I don't think it's fair to say they only want the good story. Yeah, if I said that, I didn't mean to say mean it so strongly. I meant more their incentives were not necessarily to really focus on a um, accuracy. But I'm I'm just curious. Am I um, is that wrong about the overall results at the state level from the exit polls giving us the wrong, generally not giving us an accurate picture of how those states voted? Um, uh, I don't think it's right, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't need to dwell down. <laughs> and by the way, Dave, anything yeah. that takes the focus away from the polls that we do uh, for NBC and the Wall Street Journal and focuses on election night, great. I'm glad to have somebody. <laughs> else. All right. Well, we all, we're actually uh, out of time. And uh, I'm sorry I got us off on probably somewhat of a tangent there, um, but I, uh, I really appreciate um, everyone taking their time for, uh, to put together these great presentations and answer uh, all these great questions. And uh, huge thanks uh, to the three of you. Thanks for having us.